The Iliad by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler Book 16 Recorded by Brad Powers Fire being now thrown on the ship of Protesilaus, Patroclus fights in the armor of Achilles. He drives the Trojans back, but is in the end killed by Euphorbus and Hector. Thus did they fight about the ship of Protesilaus. Then Patroclus drew near to Achilles with tears welling from his eyes, as from some spring whose crystal stream falls over the ledges of a high precipice. When Achilles saw him thus weeping, he was sorry for him, and said, Why, Patroclus, do you stand there weeping like some silly child that comes running to her mother, and begs to be taken up and carried? She catches hold of her mother's dress to stay her though she is in a hurry, and looks tearfully up until her mother carries her. Even such tears, Patroclus, are you now shedding. Have you anything to say to the Myrmidons, or to myself? Or have you had news from Phthia which you alone know? They tell me Menetius, son of Actor, is still alive, as also Peleus, son of Aeacus, among the Myrmidons, men whose loss we too should bitterly deplore. Or are you grieving about the Argives and the way in which they are being killed at the ships, through their own high-handed doings? Do not hide anything from me, but tell me that both of us may know about it. Then, O knight Patroclus, with a deep sigh, you answered, Achilles, son of Peleus, foremost champion of the Achaeans, do not be angry, but I weep for the disaster that has now befallen the Argives. All those who have been their champions so far are lying at the ships, wounded by sword or spear. Brave Diomede, son of Tydeus, has been hit with the spear, while famed Ulysses and Agamemnon have received sword wounds. Eurypylus, again, has been struck with an arrow in the thigh. Skilled apothecaries are attending to these heroes, and healing them of their wounds. Are you still, O oh Achilles, so inexorable? May it never be my lot to nurse such a passion as you have done to the baning of your own good name. Who in future story will speak well of you unless you now save the Argives from ruin? You know no pity. Knight Peleus was not your father, nor Thetis your mother, but the gray sea bore you, and the sheer cliffs begot you, so cruel and remorseless are you. If, however, you are kept back through knowledge of some oracle, or if your mother Thetis has told you something from the mouth of Jove, at least send me and the Myrmidons with me, if I may bring deliverance to the Danaeans. Let me moreover wear your armor. The Trojans may thus mistake me for you, and quit the field, so that the hard-pressed sons of the Achaeans may have breathing time, which, while they are fighting, may hardly be. We who are fresh might soon drive tired men back from our ships and tents to their own city. He knew not what he was asking nor that he was suing for his own destruction. Achilles was deeply moved, and answered, What, noble Patroclus, are you saying? I know no prophesyings which I am heeding, nor has my mother told me anything from the mouth of Jove. But I am cut to the very heart that one of my own rank should dare to rob me because he is more powerful than I am. This, after all that I have gone through, is more than I can endure. The girl whom the sons of the Achaeans chose for me, whom I won as the fruit of my spear on having sacked a city, her has King Agamemnon taken from me as though I were some common vagrant. Still, let bygones be bygones. No man may keep his anger forever. I said I would not relent till battle and the cry of war had reached my own ships. Nevertheless, now gird my armor about your shoulders, and lead the Myrmidons to battle, for the dark cloud of Trojans has burst furiously over our fleet. The Argives are driven back onto the beach, cooped within a narrow space, and the whole people of Troy has taken heart to sally out against them, because they see not the visor of my helmet gleaming near them. Had they seen this, there would not have been a creek nor grip that had not been filled with their dead as they fled back again. And so it would have been if only King Agamemnon had dealt fairly by me. As it is, the Trojans have beset our host. Diomed, son of Tydeus, no longer wields his spear to defend the Danaeans. Neither have I heard the voice of the son of Atreus coming from his hated head, whereas that of murderous Hector rings in my ears as he gives orders to the Trojans, who triumph over the Achaeans and fill the whole plain with their cry of battle. But even so, Patroclus, fall upon them and save the fleet, lest the Trojans fire it and prevent us from being able to return. 
Do, however, as I now bid you, that you may win me great honor from all the Danaeans, and that they may restore the girl to me again and give me rich gifts into the bargain. When you have driven the Trojans from the ships, come back again. Though Juno's thundering husband should put triumph within your reach, do not fight the Trojans further in my absence, or you will rob me of the glory that should be mine. And do not for lust of battle go on killing the Trojans, nor lead the Achaeans on to Ilius, lest one of the ever-living gods from Olympus attack you. For Phoebus Apollo loves them well. Return when you have freed the ships from peril, and let others wage war upon the plain. Would, by Father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo, that not a single man of all the Trojans might be left alive, nor yet of the Argives, but that we too might be alone left to tear aside the mantle that veils the brow of Troy. Thus did they converse. But Ajax could no longer hold his ground for the shower of darts that rained upon him. The will of Jove and the javelins of the Trojans were too much for him. The helmet that gleamed about his temples rang with the continuous clatter of the missiles that kept pouring on to it and on to the cheek-pieces that protected his face. Moreover, his left shoulder was tired with having held his shield so long. Yet for all this, let fly at him as they would, they could not make him give ground. He could hardly draw his breath. The sweat rained from every pore of his body. He had not a moment's respite, and on all sides he was beset by danger upon danger. And now tell me, O muses, that hold your mansions on Olympus, how fire was thrown upon the ships of the Achaeans. Hector came close up and let drive with his great sword at the ashen spear of Ajax. He cut it clean in two just behind where the point was fastened onto the shaft of the spear. Ajax, therefore, had now nothing but a headless spear, while the bronze point flew some way off and came ringing down onto the ground. Ajax knew the hand of heaven in this, and was dismayed at seeing that Jove had now left him utterly defenseless, and was willing victory for the Trojans. Therefore he drew back, and the Trojans flung fire upon the ship which was at once wrapped in flame. The fire was now flaring about the ship's stern, whereon Achilles smote his two thighs and said to Patroclus, Up! noble knight, for I see the glare of hostile fire at your fleet. Up, lest they destroy our ships, and there be no way by which we may retreat. Gird on your armor at once while I call our people together. As he spoke, Patroclus put on his armor. First he grieved his legs with greaves of good make, and fitted with ankle clasps of silver. After this he donned the cuirass of the son of Aeacus, richly inlaid and studded, he hung his silver-studded sword of bronze about his shoulders, and then his mighty shield. On his comely head he set his helmet, well wrought, with a crest of horsehair that nodded menacingly above it. He grasped two redoubtable spears that suited his hands, but he did not take the spear of noble Achilles, so stout and strong, for none other of the Achaeans could wield it, though Achilles could do so easily. This was the ashen spear from Mount Pelion, which Chiron had cut upon a mountain top and had given to Peleus, wherewith to deal out death among heroes. He bade Automedon yoke his horses with all speed, for he was the man whom he held in honor next after Achilles, and on whose support in battle he could rely most firmly. Automedon therefore yoked the fleet horses Xanthus and Baleus, steeds that could fly like the wind. These were they whom the harpy Podargi bore to the west wind as she was grazing in a meadow by the waters of the river Oceanus. In the side traces he set the noble horse Pedasus, whom Achilles had brought away with him when he sacked the city of Aetion, and who, mortal steed though he was, could take his place along with those that were immortal. Meanwhile Achilles went about everywhere among the tents, and bade his Myrmidons put on their armor. Even as fierce ravening wolves that are feasting upon a homed stag which they have killed upon the mountains, and their jaws are red with blood. They go in a pack to lap water from the clear spring with their long, thin tongues, and they reek of blood and slaughter. They know not what fear is, for it is hunger drives them. Even so did the leaders and counselors of the Myrmidons gather round the good squire of the fleet descendant of Aeacus, and among them stood Achilles himself, cheering on both men and horses. Fifty ships had noble Achilles brought to Troy, and in each there was a crew of fifty oarsmen. Over these he set five captains whom he could trust, while he was himself commander over them all. Menestheus of the gleaming corslet, son to the river Spercheus, that streams from heaven, 
was captain of the first company. Fair Polydora, daughter of Peleus, bore him to ever-flowing Spercheus, a woman mated with a god, but he was called son of Boris, son of Periores, with whom his mother was living as his wedded wife, and who gave great wealth to gain her. The second company was led by noble Eudorus, son to an unwedded woman. Polymiel, daughter of Phylus, the graceful dancer, bore him. The mighty slayer of Argos was enamored of her as he saw her among the singing women at a dance held in honor of Diana, the rushing huntress of the golden arrows. He, therefore, Mercury, giver of all good, went with her into an upper chamber, and lay with her in secret, whereon she bore him a noble son, Eudorus, singularly fleet of foot and in fight valiant. When Ilithuia, goddess of the pains of childbirth, brought him to the light of day, and he saw the face of the sun, Mighty Echecles, son of Actor, took the mother to wife, and gave great wealth to gain her. But her father, Phylus, brought the child up, and took care of him, doting as fondly upon him as though he were his own son. The third company was led by Pisander, son of Mimolus, the finest spearman among all the Myrmidons, next to Achilles' own comrade, Patroclus. The old knight Phoenix was captain of the fourth company, and Alcimedon, noble son of Laerceus of the fifth. When Achilles had chosen his men, and had stationed them all with their captains, he charged them straightly, saying, Myrmidons, remember your threats against the Trojans while you were at the ships in the time of my anger, and you were all complaining of me. Cruel son of Peleus, you would say, your mother must have suckled you on Gaul, so ruthless are you. You keep us here at the ships against our will. If you are so relentless, it were better we went home over the sea. Often have you gathered, and thus chided with me. The hour is now come for those high feats of arms that you have so long been pining for. Therefore, keep high hearts, each one of you, to do battle with the Trojans. With these words he put heart and soul into them all, and they serried their companies yet more closely when they heard their king. As the stones which a builder sets in the wall of some high house which is to give shelter from the winds, even so... Closely were the helmets and boss shields set against one another. Shield pressed on shield, helm on helm, and man on man. So close were they that the horsehair of plumes on the gleaming ridges of their helmets touched each other as they bent their heads. In front of them all two men put on their armor, Patroclus and Automedon, two men with but one mind to lead the Myrmidons. Then Achilles went inside his tent and opened the lid of the strong chest which silver-footed Thetis had given him to take on board ship, and which she had filled with shirts, cloaks to keep out the cold, and good thick rugs. In this chest he had a cup of rare workmanship, from which no man but himself might drink, nor would he make offering from it to any other god save only to Father Jove. He took the cup from the chest and cleansed it with sulphur. This done he rinsed it in clean water, and after he had washed his hands he drew wine. Then he stood in the middle of the court and prayed, looking towards heaven, and making his drink-offering of wine. Nor was he unseen of Jove, whose joy is in thunder. King Jove, he cried, Lord of Dodona, God of the Pulaski, who dwellest afar, you who hold wintry Dodona in your sway, where your prophets, the Selli, dwell around you with their feet unwashed and their couches made upon the ground. If you heard me when I prayed to you aforetime, and did me honor while you sent disaster on the Achaeans, vouchsafe me now the fulfillment of yet this further prayer. I shall stay here where my ships are lying, but I shall send my comrade into battle at the head of many Myrmidons. Grant, O all-seeing Jove, that victory may go with him. Put your courage into his heart, that Hector may learn whether my squire is man enough to fight alone, or whether his might is only then so indomitable when I myself enter the turmoil of war. Afterwards, when he has chased the fight and the cry of battle from the ships, grant that he may return unharmed with his armor and his comrades, fighters in close combat. Thus did he pray, and all counseling Jove heard his prayer. Part of it he did indeed vouchsafe him, but not the whole. He granted that Patroclus should thrust back war and battle from the ships, but refused to let him come safely out of the fight. When he had made his drink-offering, and had thus prayed, Achilles went inside his tent and put back the cup into his chest. Then he again came out, 
for he still loved to look upon the fierce fight that raged between the Trojans and the Achaeans. Meanwhile the armed band that was about Patroclus marched on till they sprang high in hope upon the Trojans. They came swarming out like wasps whose nests are by the roadside, and whom silly children love to tease whereon any one who happens to be passing may get stung. Or again, if a wayfarer going along the road vexes them by accident, every wasp will come flying out in a fury to defend his little ones. Even with such rage and courage did the Myrmidons swarm from their ships, and their cry of battle rose heavenwards. Patroclus called out to his men at the top of his voice, Myrmidons, followers of Achilles, son of Peleus, be men, my friends, fight with might and with main, that we may win glory for the son of Peleus, who is far the foremost man at the ships of the Argives, he and his close fighting followers. The son of Atreus, King Agamemnon, will thus learn his folly in showing no respect to the bravest of the Achaeans. With these words he put heart and soul into them all, and they fell in a body upon the Trojans. The ships rang again with the cry which the Achaeans raised, and when the Trojans saw the brave son of Menetius and his squire all gleaming in their armor, they were daunted, and their battalions were thrown into confusion, for they thought the fleet son of Peleus must now have put aside his anger, and have been reconciled to Agamemnon. Every one, therefore, looked round about to see whither he might fly for safety. Patroclus first aimed a spear into the middle of the press where men were packed most closely, by the stern of the ship of Protesilaus. He hit Perichmes, who had led his Paeonian horsemen from the Amadon and the broad waters of the river Axius. The spear struck him on the right shoulder, and with a groan he fell backwards in the dust. On this his men were thrown into confusion, for, by killing their leader, who was the finest soldier among them, Patroclus struck panic into them all. He thus drove them from the ship and quenched the fire that was then blazing, leaving the half-burnt ship to lie where it was. The Trojans were now driven back with a shout that rent the skies, while the Danaeans poured after them from their ships, shouting also without ceasing. As when Jove, gatherer of the thunderclouds, spreads a dense canopy on the top of some lofty mountain and all the peaks, the jutting headlands and forest glades show out in the great light that flashes from the bursting heavens. Even so, when the Danaeans had now driven back the fire from their ships, they took breath for a little while. But the fury of the fight was not yet over, for the Trojans were not driven back in utter rout, but still gave battle, and were ousted from their ground only by sheer fighting. The fight then became more scattered, and the chieftains killed one another when and how they could. The valiant son of Menetius first drove his spear into the thigh of Aurelicus, just as he was turning round. The point went clean through and broke the bone so that he fell forward. Meanwhile Menelaus struck Thoas in the chest, where it was exposed near the rim of his shield, and he fell dead. The son of Phileus saw Amphiclus about to attack him, and ere he could do so took aim at the upper part of his thigh, where the muscles are thicker than in any other part. The spear tore through all the sinews of the leg, and his eyes were closed in darkness. Of the sons of Nestor, one, Antilochus, speared Atimnius, driving the point of the spear through his throat, and down he fell. Maris then sprang on Antilochus in hand-to-hand -hand fight to avenge his brother, and bestrode the body-spear in hand. But valiant Thrasymedes was too quick for him, and in a moment had struck him in the shoulder ere he could deal his blow. His aim was true, and the spear severed all the muscles at the root of his arm, and tore them right down to the bone so he fell heavily to the ground, and his eyes were closed in darkness. Thus did these two noble comrades of Sarpedon go down to Erebus, slain by the two sons of Nestor. They were the warrior sons of Amisidorus, who had reared the invincible Chimera to the bane of many. Ajax, son of Oileus, sprang on Cleobulus and took him alive as he was entangled in the crush. But he killed him then and there by a sword-blow on the neck. The sword reeked with his blood, while dark death and the strong hand of fate gripped him and closed his eyes. Penelaus and Lycon now met in close fight, for they had missed each other with their spears. They had both thrown without effect, so now they drew their swords. Lycon struck the plumed crest of Penelaus' helmet, but his sword broke at the hilt, while Penelaus smote Lycon on the neck under the ear. The blade sank so deep that the head was held on by nothing but the skin 
and there was no more life left in him. Meriones gave chase to Achamus on foot and caught him up just as he was about to mount his chariot. He drove a spear through his right shoulder so that he fell headlong from the car, and his eyes were closed in darkness. Idomeneus speared Aramis in the mouth. The bronze point of the spear went clean through it beneath the brain, crashing in among the white bones and smashing them up. His teeth were all of them knocked out, and the blood came gushing in a stream from both his eyes. It also came gurgling up from his mouth and nostrils, and the darkness of death enfolded him round about. Thus did these chieftains of the Danaeans each of them kill his man. As ravening wolves seize on kids or lambs, fastening on them when they are alone on the hillsides and have strayed from the main flock through the carelessness of the shepherd. And when the wolves see this, they pounce upon them at once because they cannot defend themselves. Even so did the Danaeans now fall on the Trojans, who fled with ill-omened cries in their panic, and had no more fight left in them. Meanwhile great Ajax kept on trying to drive a spear into Hector, but Hector was so skillful that he held his broad shoulders well under cover of his oxhide shield, ever on the lookout for the whizzing of the arrows and the heavy thud of the spears. He well knew that the fortunes of the day had changed, but still stood his ground and tried to protect his comrades. As when a cloud goes up into heaven from Olympus, rising out of a clear sky when Jove is brewing a gale, even with such panic-stricken rout did the Trojans now fly, and there was no order in their going. Hector's fleet horses bore him and his armor out of the fight, and he left the Trojan host penned in by the deep trench against their will. Many a yoke of horses snapped the pole of their chariots in the trench, and left their master's car behind them. Patroclus gave chase calling impetuously on the Danaeans and full of fury against the Trojans, who, being now no longer in a body, filled all the ways with their cries of panic and rout. The air was darkened with the clouds of dust they raised, and the horses strained every nerve in their flight from the tents and ships towards the city. Patroclus kept on heading his horses wherever he saw most men flying in confusion, cheering on his men the while. Chariots were being smashed in all directions, and many a man came tumbling down from his own car to fall beneath the wheels of that of Patroclus, whose immortal steeds, given by the gods to Peleus, sprang over the trench at a bound as they sped onward. He was intent on trying to get near Hector, for he had set his heart on spearing him, but Hector's horses were now hurrying him away. As the whole dark earth bows before some tempest on an autumn day when Jove rains his hardest to punish men for giving crooked judgment in their courts, and deriving justice therefrom without heed to the decrees of heaven, all the rivers run full, and the torrents tear many a new channel as they roar headlong from the mountains to the dark sea, and it fares ill with the works of men. Even such was the stress and strain of the Trojan horses in their flight. Patroclus now cut off the battalions that were nearest to him, and drove them back to the ships. They were doing their best to reach the city, but he would not let them, and bore down on them between the river and the ships and wall. Many a fallen comrade did he then avenge. First he hit Pronoas with a spear on the chest where it was exposed near the rim of his shield, and he fell heavily to the ground. Next he sprang on Thestor, son of Enops, who was sitting all huddled up in his chariot, for he had lost his head and the reins had been torn out of his hands. Patroclus went up to him and drove a spear into his right jaw. He thus hooked him by the teeth, and the spear pulled him over the rim of his car, as one who sits at the end of some jutting rock and draws a strong fish out of the sea with a hook and a line. Even so with his spear did he pull Thestor all gaping from his chariot. He then threw him down on his face, and he died while falling. On this, as Aurelius was on to attack him, he struck him full on the head with a stone, and his brains were all battered inside his helmet whereon he fell headlong to the ground, and the pangs of death took hold upon him. Then he laid low, one after the other, Aramus, Amphodorus, Epaltes, Tlepolemus, Echius, son of Damastor, Pyrrhus, Iphus, Euippus, and Polymelus, son of Argeus. Now when Sarpedon saw his comrades, men who wore ungirdled tunics, being overcome by Patroclus, son of Menetius, he rebuked the Lycians, saying, Shame on you! Where are you flying to? Show your mettle. I will myself meet this man in fight, and learn who it is that is so masterful. He has done us much hurt, and has stretched many a brave man upon the ground. 
He sprang from his chariot as he spoke, and Patroclus, when he saw this, leaped onto the ground also. The two then rushed at one another with loud cries like eagle-beaked, crook-taloned vultures that scream and tear at one another in some high mountain fastness. The son of scheming Saturn looked down upon them in pity and said to Juno, who was his wife and sister, Alas, that it should be the lot of Sarpedon, whom I love so dearly, to perish by the hand of Patroclus. I am in two minds whether to catch him up out of the fight, and set him down safe and sound in the fertile land of Lycia, or to let him now fall by the hand of the son of Menetius. And Juno answered, Most dread son of Saturn, what is this that you are saying? Would you snatch a mortal man, whose doom has long been fated, out of the jaws of death? Do as you will, but we shall not all of us be of your mind. I say further, and lay my saying to your heart, that if you send Sarpedon safely to his own home, some other of the gods will be also wanting to escort his son out of battle, for there are many sons of gods fighting round the city of Troy, and you will make every one jealous. If, however, you are fond of him and pity him, let him indeed fall by the hand of Patroclus, but as soon as the life is gone out of him, send death and sweet sleep to bear him off the field, and take him to the broad lands of Lycia, where his brothers and his kinsmen will bury him with mound and pillar, in due honor to the dead. The sire of gods and men assented, but he shed a rain of blood upon the earth in honor of his son, whom Patroclus was about to kill on the rich plain of Troy, far from his home. When they were now come close to one another, Patroclus struck Thrasydemus, the brave squire of Sarpedon, in the lower part of the belly and killed him. Sarpedon then aimed a spear at Patroclus and missed him, but he struck the horse Pedasus in the right shoulder, and it screamed aloud as it lay, groaning in the dust, until the life went out of it. The other two horses began to plunge, the pole of the chariot cracked and they got entangled in the reins through the fall of the horse that was yoked along with them. But Automedon knew what to do. Without the loss of a moment, he drew the keen blade that hung by his sturdy thigh, and cut the third horse adrift, whereon the other two righted themselves, and pulling hard at the reins again, went together into battle. Sarpedon now took a second aim at Patroclus, and again missed him. The point of the spear passed over his left shoulder without hitting him. Patroclus then aimed in his turn, and the spear sped not from his hand in vain, for he hit Sarpedon just where the midriff surrounds the ever-beating heart. He fell like some oak or silver poplar, or tall pine to which woodmen have laid their axes upon the mountains, to make timber for shipbuilding. Even so did he lie stretched at full length in front of his chariot and horses, moaning and clutching at the blood-stained dust. As when a lion springs with a bound upon a herd of cattle, and fastens on a great black bull which dies bellowing in its clutches, even so did the leader of the Lycian warriors struggle in death as he fell by the hand of Patroclus. He called on his trusty comrade and said, Glaicus, my brother, hero among heroes, put forth all your strength, fight with might and main, now, if ever, quit yourself like a valiant soldier. First go about among the Lycian captains and bid them fight for Sarpedon. Then yourself also do battle to save my armor from being taken. My name will haunt you henceforth and forever if the Achaeans rob me of my armor now that I have fallen at their ships. Do your very utmost and call all my people together. Death closed his eyes as he spoke. Patroclus planted his heel on his breast and drew the spear from his body, whereon his senses came out along with it, and he drew out both spear point and Sarpedon's soul at the same time. Hard by the Myrmidons held his snorting steeds, who were wild with panic at finding themselves deserted by their lords. Glaicus was overcome with grief when he heard what Sarpedon said, for he could not help him. He had to support his arm with his other hand, being in great pain through the wound which Teucer's arrow had given him when Teucer was defending the wall as he, Glaicus, was assailing it. Therefore he prayed to far-darting Apollo, saying, Hear me, O king, from your seat, may be in the rich land of Lycia, or may be in Troy, for in all places you can hear the prayer of one who is in distress, as I now am. I have a grievous wound, my hand is aching with pain, there is no staunching the blood, and my whole arm drags by reason of my hurt, so that I cannot grasp my sword nor go among my foes and fight them. Thou art prince, 
Jove's son Sarpedon is slain. Jove defended not his son, do you? Therefore, O king, heal me of my wound, ease my pain, and grant me strength both to cheer on the Lycians, and to fight along with them round the body of him who has fallen. Thus did he pray, and Apollo heard his prayer. He eased his pain, staunched the black blood from the wound, and gave him new strength. Glaicus perceived this, and was thankful that the mighty god had answered his prayer. Forthwith, therefore, he went among the Lycian captains, and bade them come to fight about the body of Sarpedon. From these he strode on among the Trojans to Polydamus, son of Panthous, and Agenor. He then went on in search of Aeneas and Hector, and when he had found them, he said, Hector, you have utterly forgotten your allies who languish here for your sake, far from friends and home, while you do nothing to support them. Sarpedon, leader of the Lycian warriors, has fallen. He who was at once the right and might of Lycia. Mars has laid him low by the spear of Patroclus. Stand by him, my friends, and suffer not the Myrmidons to strip him of his armor, nor to treat his body with contumely and revenge for all the Danaeans whom we have speared at the ships. As he spoke, the Trojans were plunged in extreme and ungovernable grief. For Sarpedon, alien though he was, had been one of the main stays of their city, both as having much people with him, and himself the foremost among them all. Led by Hector, who was infuriated by the fall of Sarpedon, they made instantly for the Danaeans with all their might, while the undaunted spirit of Patroclus, son of Menetius, cheered on the Achaeans. First he spoke to the two Ajaxes, men who needed no bidding. Ajaxes, said he, may it now please you to show yourselves the men who have always been, or even better, Sarpedon is fallen, he who was first to overleap the wall of the Achaeans. Let us take the body and outrage it. Let us strip the armor from his shoulders and kill his comrades if they try to rescue his body. He spoke to men who of themselves were full eager. Both sides, therefore, the Trojans and Lycians on the one hand, and the Myrmidons and Achaeans on the other, strengthened their battalions and fought desperately about the body of Sarpedon, shouting fiercely the while. Mighty was the din of their armor as they came together, and Jove shed a thick darkness over the fight to increase the toil of the battle over the body of his son. At first the Trojans made some headway against the Achaeans, for one of the best men among the Myrmidons was killed, Epiagus, son of noble Agacles, who had erewhile been king in the good city of Budium. But presently, having killed a valiant kinsman of his own, he took refuge with Peleus and Thetis, who sent him to Ilius, the land of noble steeds, to fight the Trojans under Achilles. Hector now struck him on the head with a stone, just as he had caught hold of the body, and his brains inside his helmet were all battered in, so that he fell face foremost upon the body of Sarpedon, and there died. Patroclus was enraged by the death of his comrade, and sped through the front ranks as swiftly as a hawk that swoops down on a flock of daws or starlings. Even so swiftly, O noble knight Patroclus, did you make straight for the Lycians and Trojans to avenge your comrade. Forthwith he struck Sthenelaus, the son of Athemenes, on the neck with a stone, and broke the tendons that join it to the head and spine. On this Hector and the front rank of his men gave ground. As far as a man can throw a javelin when competing for some prize, or even in battle, so far did the Trojans now retreat before the Achaeans. Glaicus, captain of the Lycians, was the first to rally them, by killing Bathocles, son of Chalcon, who lived in Hellas and was the richest man among the Myrmidons. Glaicus turned round suddenly, just as Bathocles, who was pursuing him, was about to lay hold of him, and drove his spear right into the middle of his chest, whereon he fell heavily to the ground, and the fall of so good a man filled the Achaeans with dismay, while the Trojans were exultant and came up in a body round the corpse. Nevertheless, the Achaeans, mindful of their prowess, bore straight down upon them. Meriones then killed a helmed warrior of the Trojans, Leogenes, son of Oneter, who was the priest of Jove of Mount Ida, and was honored by the people as though he were a god. Meriones struck him under the jaw and the ear, so that life went out of him, and the darkness of death laid hold upon him. Aeneas then aimed a spear at Meriones, hoping to hit him under the shield as he was advancing but Meriones saw it coming and stooped forward to avoid it, whereon the spear flew past him and the point stuck in the ground, while the butt-end went on quivering till Mars robbed it of its force. 
The spear, therefore, sped from Aeneas's hand in vain, and fell quivering to the ground. Aeneas was angry, and said, Meriones, you are a good dancer, but if I had hit you, my spear would soon have made an end of you. And Meriones answered, Aeneas, for all your bravery, you will not be able to make an end of every one who comes against you. You are only immortal like myself, and if I were to hit you in the middle of your shield with my spear, however strong and self-confident you may be, I should soon vanquish you, and you would yield your life to Hades of the noble steeds. On this the son of Menetius rebuked him and said, Meriones, hero though you may be, you should not speak thus. Taunting speeches, my good friend, will not make the Trojans draw away from the dead body. Some of them must go underground first. Blows for battle and words for counsel. Fight, therefore, and say nothing. He led the way as he spoke, and the hero went forward with him. As the sound of woodcutters in some forest glade upon the mountains, and the thud of their axes is heard afar, even such a din now rose from earth-clash of bronze armor and of good ox-hide shields, as men smote each other with their swords and spears pointed at both ends. A man had need of good eyesight now to know Sarpedon, so covered was he from head to foot with spears and blood and dust. Men swarmed about the body as flies that buzz around the full milk pails in spring when they are brimming with milk. Even so did they gather round Sarpedon. Nor did Jove turn his keen eyes away for one moment from the fight, but kept looking at it all the time, for he was settling how best to kill Patroclus, and considering whether Hector should be allowed to end him now in the fight round the body of Sarpedon, and strip him of his armor, or whether he should let him give yet further trouble to the Trojans. In the end he deemed it best that the brave squire of Achilles, son of Peleus, should drive Hector and the Trojans back towards the city, and take the lives of many. First, therefore, he made Hector turn faint-hearted, whereon he mounted his chariot and fled, bidding the other Trojans fly also, for he saw that the scales of Jove had turned against him. Neither would the brave Lycians stand firm. They were dismayed when they saw their king lying struck to the heart amid a heap of corpses. For when the son of Saturn made the fight wax hot, many had fallen above him. The Achaeans, therefore, stripped the gleaming armor from his shoulders, and the brave son of Menetius gave it to his men to take to the ships. Then Jove, lord of the storm-cloud, said to Apollo, Dear Phoebus, go, I pray you, and take Sarpedon out of range of the weapons. Cleanse the black blood from off him, and then bear him a long way off, where you may wash him in the river, anoint him with ambrosia, and clothe him in immortal raiment. This done, commit him to the arms of the two fleet messengers, death and sleep, who will carry him straightway to the rich land of Lycia, where his brothers and kinsmen will inter him, and will raise both mound and pillar to his memory in due honor to the dead. Thus he spoke. Apollo obeyed his father's saying, and came down from the heights of Ida into the thick of the fight. Forthwith he took Sarpedon out of range of the weapons, and then bore him a long way off, where he washed him in the river, anointed him with ambrosia, and clothed him in immortal raiment. This done, he committed him to the arms of the two fleet messengers, Death and Sleep, who presently set him down in the rich land of Lycia. Meanwhile Patroclus, with many a shout to his horses and to Automedon, pursued the Trojans and Lycians in the pride and foolishness of his heart. Had he but obeyed the bidding of the son of Peleus, he would have escaped death and have been scatheless. But the counsels of Jove pass man's understanding. He will put even a brave man to flight and snatch victory from his grasp, or again he will set him on to fight, as he now did when he put a high spirit into the heart of Patroclus. Who then first and who last was slain by you, O Patroclus, when the gods had now called you to meet your doom? First, Adrestus, Atonous, Achiclus, Perimus the son of Megus, Epistor, and Melanippus. After these he killed Elysus, Mulius, and Pylartes. These he slew, but the rest saved themselves by flight. The sons of the Achaeans would now have taken Troy by the hands of Patroclus, for his spear flew in all directions, had not Phoebus Apollo taken his stand upon the wall to defeat his purpose and to aid the Trojans. Thrice did Patroclus charge at an angle of the high wall, and thrice did Apollo beat him back, striking his shield with his own immortal hands. When Patroclus was coming on like a god for yet a fourth time, Apollo shouted to him with an awful voice and said, Draw back, 
noble Patroclus, it is not your lot to sack the city of the Trojan chieftains, nor yet will it be that of Achilles, who is a far better man than you are. On hearing this, Patroclus withdrew to some distance and avoided the anger of Apollo. Meanwhile, Hector was waiting with his horses inside the Scian gates, in doubt whether to drive out again and go on fighting, or to call the army inside the gates. As he was thus doubting, Phoebus Apollo drew near him in the likeness of a young and lusty warrior Asias, who was Hector's uncle, being own brother to Hecuba and son of Dimas, who lived in Phrygia, by the waters of the river Sangarius. In his likeness, Jove's son Apollo now spoke to Hector, saying, Hector, why have you left off fighting? It is ill done of you. If I were as much better a man than you, as I am worse, you should soon rue your slackness. Drive straight towards Patroclus, if so be that Apollo may grant you a triumph over him, and you may rule him. With this the god went back into the hurly-burly, and Hector bade Cebriones drive again into the fight. Apollo passed in among them and struck panic into the Argives, while he gave triumph to Hector and the Trojans. Hector let the other Danaeans alone and killed no man, but drove straight at Patroclus. Patroclus then sprang from his chariot to the ground with a spear in his left hand, and in his right a jagged stone as large as his hand could hold. He stood still and threw it, nor did it go far without hitting someone. The cast was not in vain, for the stone struck Cebriones, Hector's charioteer, a bastard son of Priam, as he held the reins in his hands. The stone hit him on the forehead and drove his brows into his head, for the bone was smashed, and his eyes fell to the ground at his feet. He dropped dead from his chariot as though he were diving, and there was no more life left in him. Over him did you then vaunt, O knight Patroclus, saying, Bless my heart how active he is, and how well he dives. If he had been at sea, this fellow would have dived from the ship's side and brought up as many oysters as the whole crew could stomach, even in rough water, for he has dived beautifully off his chariot onto the ground. It seems, then, that there are divers also among the Trojans. As he spoke, he flung himself on Cebriones with the spring, as it were, of a lion that while attacking a stockyard is himself struck in the chest, and his courage is his own bane. Even so furiously, O Patroclus, did you then spring upon Cebriones. Hector sprang also from his chariot to the ground. The pair then fought over the body of Cebriones. As two lions fight fiercely on some high mountain over the body of a stag that they have killed, even so did these two mighty warriors, Patroclus, son of Menetius, and brave Hector, hack and hew at one another over the corpse of Cebriones. Hector would not let him go when he had at once got him by the head, while Patroclus kept fast hold of his feet, and a fierce fight raged between the other Danaeans and Trojans. As the east and south wind buffet one another when they beat upon some dense forest on the mountains, there is beech and ash and spreading cornel, the top of the trees roar as they beat on one another, and one can hear the boughs cracking and breaking. Even so did the Trojans and Achaeans spring upon one another and lay about each other, and neither side would give way. Many a pointed spear fell to the ground, and many a winged arrow sped from its bowstring about the body of Cebriones. Many a great stone, moreover, beat on many a shield as they fought around his body. But there he lay in the whirling clouds of dust, all huge and hugely, heedless of his driving now. So long as the sun was still high in mid-heaven, the weapons of either side were alike deadly, and the people fell. But when he went down towards the time when men loosed their oxen, the Achaeans proved to be beyond all forecast stronger, so that they drew Cebriones out of range of the darts and tumult of the Trojans, and stripped the armor from his shoulders. Then Patroclus sprang like Mars with fierce intent and a terrific shout upon the Trojans, and thrice did he kill nine men. But as he was coming on like a god for a time, then, O Patroclus, was the hour of your end approaching, for Phoebus fought you and fell earnest. Patroclus did not see him as he moved about in the crush, for he was enshrouded in thick darkness, and the god struck him from behind on his back and on his broad shoulders with the flat of his hand, so that his eyes turned dizzy. Phoebus Apollo beat the helmet from off his head, and it rolled rattling off under the horse's feet, where its horsehair plumes were all begrimed with dust and blood. Never indeed had that helmet fared so before, for it had served to protect the head and comely forehead of the godlike hero Achilles. 
Now, however, Zeus delivered it over to be worn by Hector. Nevertheless, the end of Hector also was near. The bronze-shod spear, so great and so strong, was broken in the hand of Patroclus, while his shield that covered him from head to foot fell to the ground, as did also the band that held it, and Apollo undid the fastenings of his corslet. On this his mind became clouded. His limbs failed him, and he stood as one dazed. Whereon Euphorbus, son of Panthous, a Dardanian, the best spearman of his time, as also the finest horseman and fleetest runner, came behind him and struck him in the back with a spear, midway between the shoulders. This man, as soon as ever he had come up with his chariot, had dismounted twenty men, so proficient was he in all the arts of war. He it was, O knight Patroclus, that first drove a weapon into you, but he did not quite overpower you. Euphorbus then ran back into the crowd, after drawing his ashen spear out of the wound. He would not stand firm and wait for Patroclus, unarmed though he now was, to attack him. But Patroclus, unnerved, alike by the blow the god had given him, and by the spear wound, drew back under cover of his men in fear for his life. Hector, on this, seeing him to be wounded and giving ground, forced his way through the ranks, and when close up with him struck him in the lower part of the belly with a spear, driving the bronze point right through it, so that he fell heavily to the ground to the great of the Achaeans. As when a lion has fought some fierce wild boar and worsted him, the two fight furiously upon the mountain over some little fountain at which they would both drink, and the lion has beaten the boar till he can hardly breathe. Even so did Hector, son of Priam, take the life of the brave son of Menetius who had killed so many, striking him from close at hand, and vaunting over him the while. Patroclus, said he, you deemed that you should sack our city, rob our Trojan women of their freedom, and carry them off in your ships to your own country. Fool! Hector and his fleet horses were ever straining their utmost to defend them. I am foremost of all the Trojan warriors to stave the day of bondage from off them. As for you, vultures shall devour you here. Poor wretch! Achilles with all his bravery availed you nothing. And yet I ween when you left him he charged you straightly, saying, Come not back to the ships, knight Patroclus, till you have rent the blood-stained shirt of murderous Hector about his body. Thus, I ween, did he charge you, and your fool's heart answered him, yea, within you. Then, as the life ebbed out of you, you answered, O knight Patroclus, Hector, vaunt as you will, for Jove, the son of Saturn, and Apollo have vouchsafed you victory. It is they who have vanquished me so easily, and they who have stripped the armor from my shoulders. Had twenty such men as you attacked me, all of them would have fallen before my spear. Fate and the son of Leto have overpowered me, and among mortal men, Euphorbus. You are yourself third only in the killing of me. I say further, and lay my saying to your heart, you too shall live but for a little season. Death and the day of your doom are close upon you, and they will lay you low by the hand of Achilles, son of Aeacus. When he had thus spoken, his eyes were closed in death. His soul left his body and flitted down to the house of Hades, mourning its sad fate and bidding farewell to the youth and vigor of its manhood. Dead though he was, Hector still spoke to him, saying, Patroclus, why should you thus foretell my doom? Who knows but Achilles, son of lovely Thetis, may be smitten by my spear and die before me? As he spoke, he drew the bronze spear from the wound, planting his foot upon the body, which he thrust off and let lie on its back. He then went spear in hand after Automedon, squire of the fleet, descendant of Aeacus, for he longed to lay him low. But the immortal steeds which the gods had given as a rich gift to Peleus bore him swiftly from the field. End of Book 16 of the Iliad The Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler Book 17, recording by M. L. Cohen The Light Around the Body of Patroclus Brave Menelaus, son of Atreus, now came to know that Patroclus had fallen and made his way through the front ranks, clad in full armor to bestride him. As a cow stands lowing over her first calf, even so did yellow-haired Menelaus bestride Patroclus. He held his round shield and his spear in front of him, resolute to kill any who should dare face him. But the son of Pantheos also had noted the body, and came up to Menelaus, saying, Menelaus, son of Atreus, draw back, leave the body, and let the bloodstained spoils be. 
I was first of the Trojans in their brave alleys to drive my spear into Patroclus. Let me, therefore, have my full glory among the Trojans, or I will take aim and kill you. To this, Menelaus answered in great anger, By Father Joe, boasting is an ill thing. The part is not more bold, nor the lion, nor savage wild boar, which is fiercest and most dauntless of all creatures, than are the proud sons of Panthos. Yet Hyperenor did not see out the days of his youth when he made light of me and withstood me, deeming me mean the meanest soldier among the Danaans. His own feet never bore him back to gladden his wife and parents. Even so shall I make an end of you too, if you withstand me. Get you back into the crowd and do not face me, or it shall be the worse for you. Even a fool may be wise after the event. Euphorbus would not listen and said, Now indeed, Menelaus, shall you pay for the death of my brother Omer whom you vaunted, and whose wife you widowed in her bridal chamber, while you bought grief unspeakable on his parents. I shall comfort these poor people if I bring your head and armor and place them in the hands of Pantheus and noble Phrontis. The time is come when the matter shall be fought out and settled, for me or against me. As he spoke, he struck Menelaus full on the shield, but the spear did not go through, for the shield turned its point. Menelaus then took aim, praying to the father Jove as he did so. Euphorbus was drawing back, and Menelaus struck him about the roots of his throat, leaving his whole weight on the spear so as to drive it home. The point went clean through his neck, and his armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. His hair, which was like that of the graces, and his locks, so deftly bound in bands of silver and gold, were all bedrabbled with blood. As one who has grown a fine young alva tree in a clear space where there is abundance of water, the plant is full of promise, and though the winds beat upon it from every quarter puts forth its white blossoms, till the blast of some fierce hurricane sweep down upon it and level it with the ground. Even so did Menelaus strip the fair youth Euphorbus of his armor after he had slain him. Or, as some fierce line upon the mountains in the pride of his strength fastens on the finest heifer in a herd as it's feeding, first he breaks her neck with his strong jaws, and then gorges on her blood and entrails. Dogs and shepherd raise a hue and cry against him, but they stand aloof and will not come close to him, for they are pale with fear. Even so, no one had the courage to face valiant Menelaus. The son of Atreus would have then carried off the armor of the son of Panthos with ease, had not Phoebus Apollo been angry, and in the guise of Mentes, chief of the Cycons, incited Hector to attack him. Hector, said he, you are now going after the horses of the noble son of Atreus, but you will not take them. They cannot be kept in hand and driven by mortal man, save only by Achilles, who was son to an immortal mother. Meanwhile, Menelaus, son of Atreus, had bestridden the body of Patroclus and killed the noblest of the Trojans, Euphorbus, son of Pantheus, so that he can fight no more. The god then went back into the toil and turmoil, but the soul of Hector was darkened with a cloud of grief. He looked along the ranks and saw Euphorbus lying on the ground with the blood still flowing from his wound, and Menelaus stripping him of his armor. On this, he made his way to the front like a flame of fire, clad in his gleaming armor, and crying with a loud voice. When the son of Atreus heard him, he said to himself in his dismay, Alas, what shall I do? I may not let the Trojans take the armor of Patroclus, who had fallen fighting in my behalf, lest some Danan who sees me should cry shame upon me. Still, if for my honor's sake I fight Hector and the Trojans single-handed, they will prove too many for me, for Hector is bringing them up in force. Why, however, should I thus hesitate? When a man fights in despite of heaven with one whom a god befriends, he will soon rue it. Let no Danan think ill of me if I give place to Hector, for the hand of heaven is with him. Yet, if I could find Ajax, the two of us would fight Hector in heaven too, if we might only save the body of Patroclus for Achilles' son of Peleus. This, of many evils, would be the least. While he was thus in two minds, the Trojans came up to him with Hector at their head. He therefore drew back and left the body, turning about like some bearded lion who is being chased by dogs and men from the stockyard with spears and hue and cry, whereupon he is daunted and slinks sulkily off. Even so did Menelaus son of Atreus turn and leave the body of Patroclus. When among the body of his men, he looked around for mighty Ajax son of Telamon, and presently saw him on the extreme left of the fight, cheering on his men and exhorting them to keep on fighting, for Phoebus Apollo had spread a great panic among them. He ran up to him and said, Ajax, my good friend, come with me at once to dead Patroclus. If so be that we may take the body to Achilles, as for his armor, Hector already has it. These words stirred the heart of Ajax, and he made his way among the front ranks, Menelaus going with him. Hector had stripped Patroclus of his armor and was dragging him away to cut off his head and take the body to fling before the dogs of Troy. 
But Ajax came up with his shield like a wall before him, on which Hector withdrew under shelter of his men, and sprang on to his chariot, giving the armor over to the Trojans to take to the city, as a great trophy for himself. Ajax therefore covered the body of Patroclus with his broad shield, and bestrode him as a lion stands over his whelps if hunters have come upon him in a forest when he is with his little ones. In the pride and fierceness of his strength he draws his knit brows down till they cover his eyes. Even so did Ajax bestride the body of Patroclus, and by his side stood Menelaus son of Atreus, nursing great sorrow in his heart. Then Glaucus son of Hippolochus looked fiercely at Hector and rebuked him sternly. Hector, said he, you make a brave show, but in fight you are sadly wanting. A runaway like yourself has no claim to so great a reputation. Think how you may now save your town and citadel by the hands of your own people born in Ilius, for you will get no Lycians to fight for you, seeing what thanks they have had for their incessant hardships. Are you likely, sir, to do anything to help a man of less note after leaving Sarpedon, who was at once your guest and comrade in arms, to be the spoil and prey of the Danans? So long as he lived, he did good service both to your city and yourself, yet you had no stomach to save his body from the dogs. If the Lycians will listen to me, they will go home and leave Troy to its fate. If the Trojans had any of that daring, fearless spirit which lays hold of men who are fighting for their country and harassing those who would attack it, we should soon bear off Patroclus into Ilius. Could we get this dead man away and bring him to the city of Priam? The Argives would readily give up the armor of Sarpedon, and we should get his body to boot. For he whose squire has now been killed is the foremost man at the ships of the Achaeans. He and his close fighting followers... Nevertheless, you dare not make a stand against Ajax, nor face him eye to eye with the battle all round you, for he is a braver man than you are. Hector scowled at him and answered, Glaucus, you should know better. I have held you so far as a man of more understanding than any in all Lycia, but now I despise you for saying that I am afraid of Ajax. I fear neither battle nor din of chariots, but Jove's will is stronger than ours. Jove at one time makes even a strong man draw back and snatch his victory from his grasp, while at another he will set him on to fight. Come hither then, my friend. Stand by me and see indeed whether I shall play the coward the whole day through as you say, or whether I shall not stay some even of the boldest Danans from fighting round the body of Patroclus. As he spoke, he called loudly on the Trojans, saying, Trojans, Lycians, and Dardanians! Fighters in close combat, be men, my friends, and fight might and main, while I put on the goodly arm of Achilles, which I took when I killed Patroclus. With this, Hector left the fight, and ran full speed after his men who were taking the arm of Achilles to Troy, but had not yet got far. Standing for a while apart from the woeful fight, he changed his armor. His own he sent to the strong city of Ilius and to the Trojans, while he put on the immortal armor of the son of Peleus, which the gods had given to Peleus, who in his age gave it to his son, but the son did not grow old in his father's armor. When Jove, lord of the storm clouds, saw Hector standing aloof and arming himself in the armor of the son of Peleus, he wagged his head and muttered to himself, Ah, poor wretch, you arm in the armor of a hero, before whom many another trembles and you wreck nothing of the doom that is already close upon you. You have killed his comrade so brave and strong, but it was not well that you should strip the armor from his head and shoulders. I do indeed endow you with a great might now, but as against this you shall not return from battle to lay the armor of the son of Peleus before Andromache. The son of Saturn bowed his pretentious brows, and Hector fitted the army to his body, while terrible Mars entered into him and filled his whole body with might and valor. With a shout he strode in among the allies, and his armor flashed about him, so he seemed to all of them like the great son of Peleus himself. He went about among them and cheered them on. Mesles, Glaucus, Medon, Theriscles, Ariapius, Decenor, and Hippothus, Phocis, Chromius, and Enemus the Augur. All these did he exhort saying, Hear me, allies from other cities who are here in your thousands. It was not in order to have a crowd about me that I called you hither each from his several city, but that with heart and soul you might defend the wives and little ones of the Trojans from the fierce Achaeans. For this do I oppress my people with your food and the presents that make you rich. Therefore turn and charge at the foe, to stand or fall as is the game of war, whoever shall bring Patroclus, dead though he be, into the hands of the Trojans, and shall make Ajax give way before him, I will give him one half the spoils, while I keep the other. He will thus share like honor with myself. When he had thus spoken, they charged full weight upon the Danans with their spears held out before them, and the hopes of each ran high that he should force Ajax, son of Telamon, to yield up the body. Fools that they were, for he was about to take the lives of many. 
Then Ajax said to Menelaus, My good friend Menelaus, you and I shall hardly come out of this fight alive. I am less concerned for the body of Patroclus, who will shortly become meat for the dogs and vultures of Troy, than for the safety of my own head and yours. Hector has wrapped us round in a storm of battle from every quarter, and our destruction seems now certain. Call then upon the princes of the Danans, if there is any who can hear us. Menelaus did as he said, and shouted to the Danans for help at the top of his voice. My friends, he cried, princes and counselors of the Argives, all you who are with Agamemnon and Menelaus drink at the public cost, and give orders each to his own people as Jove vouchsafes in power and glory. The fight is so thick about me that I cannot distinguish you severally. Come on, therefore, every man unbidden, and think it shame that Patroclus should become meat and morsel for Trojan hounds. Fleet Ajax, son of Oileus, heard him, and was first to force his way through the fight and run to help him. Next came Idomeneus and Meriones, his esquire, peer of murderous Mars. As for the others, they came into the fight after theirs. Who of his own self could name them? The Trojans with Hector at their head charged in a body, as a great wave that comes thundering in at the mouth of some heaven-born river, and the rocks that jut into the sea ring with a roar of breakers that beat and buffet them. Even with such a roar did the Trojans come on. But the Achaeans in singleness of heart stood firm about the son of Minotius, and fenced him in with their bronze shields. Jove, moreover, hid the brightness of their helmets in a thick cloud, for he had borne no grudge against the son of Minotius while he was still alive, and squire to the descendant of Achaeus. Therefore he was loath to let him fall prey to the dogs of his foes the Trojans, and urged his comrades on to defend him. At first the Trojans drove the Achaeans back, and they withdrew from the dead man daunted. The Trojans did not succeed in killing anyone, nevertheless they drew the body away. But the Achaeans did not lose it long, for Ajax, foremost of all the Danans after the son of Peleus, alike in stature and prowess, quickly rallied them, and made towards the front like a wild boar upon the mountain, when he stands at bay in the forest glades, and routs the hounds and lusty youths that have attacked him. Even so did Ajax son of Telamon, passing easily among the phalanxes of the Trojans, disperse those who had bestridden Patroclus, and who were most bent on winning glory by dragging him off to their city. At this moment, Hippothus, brave son of Pegasus and Lethius, in his zeal for Hector and the Trojans, was dragging the body off by the foot through the press of the fight, having bound a strap round the sinews near the ankle. But a mischief soon befell him from which none of those could save him who had gladly done so, for the son of Telamon sprang forward and smote him on his brown-cheeked helmet. The plumed headpiece broke about the point of the weapon, struck at once by the spear and by the strong hand of Ajax, so that the bloody brain came oozing out through the crest socket. His strength then failed him, and he let Patroclus' foot drop from his hand, as he fell full length dead upon the body. Thus he died far from the fertile land of Larissa, and never repaid his parents the cost of bringing him up, for his life was cut short early by the spear of mighty Ajax. Hector then took aim at Ajax with a spear, but he saw its coming and just managed to avoid it. The spear passed on and struck Sidious, son of noble Iphthius, captain of the Phocians, who dwelt in famed Panopeus and reigned over much people. It struck him under the middle of the collarbone, the bronze point went right through him, coming out the bottom of his shoulder blade, and his armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. Ajax in his turn struck noble Phorcys, son of Phenops, in the middle of his belly as he was bestriding Hippothus, and broke the plate of his cuirass, whereupon the spear tore out his entrails, and he clutched the ground in the palm as he fell to the earth. Hector and those who were in the front rank then gave ground, while the Argives raised a loud cry of triumph and drew off the bodies of Phorcys and Hippothus, which they stripped presently of their armor. The Trojans would now have been worsted by the brave Achaeans and driven back to Ilius through their own cowardice, while the Argives, so great was their courage and endurance, would have achieved a triumph even against the will of Jove, if Apollo had not Royus Aeneas, in the likeness of Paraphius, son of Epteus, an attendant who had grown old in the service of Aeneas's aged father, and was at all times devoted to him. In his likeness, then, Apollo said, Aeneas, can you not manage, even though heaven be against us, to save high Ilius? I have known men whose numbers, courage, and self-reliance have saved their people in spite of Jove, whereas in this case he would much rather give victory to us than to the Danans, if you would only fight instead of being so terribly afraid. Aeneas knew Apollo when he looked straight at him and shouted to Hector, saying, Hector and all other Trojans and allies, shame on us if we are beaten by the Achaeans and driven back to Ilius through our own cowardice. A god has just come up to me and told me that Jove the Supreme Disposer will be with us. 
Therefore, let us make for the Danans that it may go hard with them ere they bear away dead Procrocolus to their ships. As he spoke, he sprang out far in front of the others, who then rallied and again faced the Achaeans. Aeneas speared Leoctorus, son of Arisbus, a valiant follower of Lycomedes, and Lycomedes was moved with pity as he saw him fall. He therefore went close up and speared Apassion, son of Hippasius, shepherd of his people under the liver in the midriff, so that he died. He had come from fertile Paeonia and was the best man of all of them after Asteropius. Asteropius flew forward to avenge him and attack the Danans, but this might no longer be, inasmuch as those about Patroclus were well covered by their shields and held their spears in front of them. For Ajax had given them strict orders that no man was either to give ground or to stand out before the others, for all were to hold well together about the body and fight hand to hand. Thus did huge Ajax bid them, and the earth ran red with blood as the corpses fell thick on one another alike the side of the Trojans and allies, and on that of the Danans. For these last, too, fought no bloodless fight, though many fewer of them perished, through the care they took to defend and stand by one another. Thus did they fight as it were a flaming fire. It seemed as though it had gone hard even with the sun and moon, for they were hidden over all that part where the bravest heroes were fighting about the dense of Menelaus, where the other Danans and Achaeans fought at their ease in full daylight with bright sunshine all round them, and there was not a cloud to be seen neither on plain nor mountain. These last morrow would rest for a while and leave off fighting, for they were some distance apart and beyond the range of one another's weapons, whereas those who were in the thick of the fray suffered both from battle and darkness. All the best of them were being worn out by the great weight of their armor, but the two valiant heroes, Thrasymedes and Antilochus, had not yet heard of the death of Patroclus, and believed him still to be alive and leading the van against the Trojans. They were keeping themselves in reserve against the death or rout of their own comrades, for so Nestor had ordered when he sent them from the ships into battle. Thus, through the livelong day, did they wage fierce war, and the sweat of their toil rained ever on their legs under them and on their hands and eyes as they fought over the squire of the fleet son of Peleus. It was as when a man gives a great ox hide all drenched in fat to his men, and bids them stretch it, whereupon they stand round it in a ring and tug till the moisture leaves it, and the fat soaks in for the many that pull at it, and it is well stretched. Even so did the two sides tug the dead body hither and thither within the compass of but a little space. The Trojans steadfastly set on dragging it into Ilius, while the Achaeans were no less so on taking it to their ships, and fierce was the fight between them. Not Mars himself, lord of hosts, nor yet Minerva, even in their fullest fury, could make light of such a battle. Such fearful turmoil of men and horses did Jove on that day ordain round the body of Patroclus. Meanwhile, Achilles did not know that he had fallen, for the fight was under the wall of Troy a long way off from the ships. He had no idea, therefore, that Patroclus was dead and deemed that he would return alive as soon as he had gone close up to the gates. He knew that he was not to sack the city neither with nor without himself, for his mother had often told him this when he sat alone with her, and she had informed him of the counsels of great Jove. Now, however, she had not told him how a great disaster had befallen him of the death of the one who was far dearest to him of all his comrades. The others still kept on charging one another round the body with their pointed spears and killing each other. Then one would say, My friends, we can never again show our faces at the ships. Better, and greatly better, that the earth should open and swallow us here in this place, that we should let the Trojans have the triumph of bearing off Patroclus to their city. The Trojans also on their part spoke to one another, saying, Friends, though we fall to a man beside this body, let none shrink from fighting. With such words did they exhort each other. They fought and fought, and an iron clank rose through the void air to the brazen vault of heaven. The horses of the descendant of Asia stood out in fight and wept when they heard that their driver had been laid low by the hand of murderous Hector. Automedon, valiant son of Diores, lashed them again and again. Many a time did he speak kindly to them, and many a time did he upbraid them. But they would neither go back to the ships by the waters of the broad Hellespont, nor yet into battle among the Achaeans. They stood with their chariots stock still as a pillar set over a tomb of some dead man or woman, and bowed their heads to the ground. Hot tears fell from their eyes as they mourned the loss of their charioteer, and their noble manes drooped all wet from under the yoke straps on either side of the yoke. The son of Saturn saw them and took pity upon their sorrow. He wagged his head and muttered to himself, saying, Poor things, why did we give you to King Peleus who is immortal, while you are yourselves ageless and immortal? What is that you might share the sorrows that befall mankind? For of all creatures that live and move upon the earth, there is none so pitiable as he is. Still Hector, son of Priam, shall drive neither you nor your chariot. I will not have it. 
It is enough that he should have the armor over which he vaunts so vainly. Furthermore, I will give you strength of heart and limb to bear Otimedon safely to the ships from battle, for I shall let the Trojans triumph still further, and go on killing till they reach the ships, whereupon night shall fall and darkness overshadow the land. As he spoke, he breathed heart and strength into the horses so that they shook the dust from out of their manes and bore their chariots swiftly into the fight that raged between Trojans and Achaeans. Behind them fought Automedon, full of sorrow for his comrade, as a vulture amid a flight of geese. In and out, here and there, full speed he dashed amid the throng of the Trojans, but for all the fury of his pursuit he killed no man, for he could not wield his spear and keep his horses in hand. When alone in the chariot, at last, however, a comrade, Alcimedon, son of Laerces, son of Haman, caught sight of him and came up behind his chariot. Automedon, said he, what god has put this folly into your heart and robbed you of your right mind, that you fight the Trojans in the front rank single-handed? He who was your comrade is slain, and Hector plumes himself on being armed in the armor of the descendant of Aeacus. Automedon, son of Diores, answered, Alcimedon, there is no one else who can control and guide the immortal steed so well as you can, save only Patroclus, while he was alive, peer of gods and counsel. Take the whip and reins while I go from the car and fight. Alcimedon sprung onto the chariot and caught up in the whips and reins, while Automedon leaped from off the car. When Hector saw him, he said to Aeneas who was near him, Aeneas, counselor of the Malgad Trojans, I see the steeds of the fleet son of Aeacus coming into battle with weak hands to drive them. I am sure, if you think well, that we might take them. They will not dare face us if we both attack them. The valiant son of Anchises was of the same mind, and the pair went right on with their shoulders covered under shields of tough dry oxide overlaid with much browns. Chromius and Aretas went along with them, and their hearts beat high with the hope that they might kill the men and capture the horses, fools that they were, for they were not to return scatheless from their meeting with Otimedon, who prayed to his father Jove and was forthwith filled with courage and strength abounding. He turned to his trusty comrade Alcimedon and said, Alcimedon, keep your horses so close up that I may feel their breath upon my back. I doubt that we shall not stay Hector, son of Priam, till he has killed us and mounted behind the horses. He will then either spread panic among the ranks of the Achaeans or himself be killed among the foremost. On this he cried out to the two Ajaxes and Menelaus, Ajaxes, captain of the Argives, and Menelaus, give the dead body over to them that were best able to defend it and come to the rescue of us living. For Hector and Aeneas are the two best men among the Trojans, are pressing us hard in the full tide of war. Nevertheless, the issue lies in the lap of heaven. I will therefore hurl my spear and leave no rest to Jove. He poised and hurled as he spoke, whereon the spear struck the round shield of Aretas and went right through it, for the shield stayed it not, so it was driven through his belt into the lower part of his belly. As when some sturdy youth, axe in hand, deals his blow behind the horns of an ox and severs the tendons at the back of its neck so that it springs forward and then drops, even so did Aratus give one bound and then fall on his back, the spear quivering in his body, till it made an end of him. Hector then aimed a spear at Otimedon, but he saw it coming and stooped forward to avoid it, so that it flew past him and the point struck in the ground, while the butt end went on quivering till Mars robbed it of its force. They would then have fought hand to hand with swords had not the two Ajaxes forced their way through the crowd when they heard their comrades calling and parted them for all their fury. For Hector, Aeneas, and Chromius were afraid and drew back, leaving Aretas to lie there struck to the heart. Automedon, peer of fleet Mars, then stripped him of his armor and vaunted over him, saying, I have done little to assuage my sorrow for the son of Melchus, for the man I have killed is not so good as he was. As he spoke, he took the bloodstained spoils and laid them upon his chariot. Then he mounted the car with his hands and feet all steeped in gore as a lion that has been gorging upon a bull. And now the fierce groanful fight again raged about Patroclus, for Minerva came down from heaven and roused his fury by the command of far-seeing Jove, who had changed his mind and sent her to encourage the Danans. As when Jove bends his bright bow in the heaven to token to mankind neither of war or of the chill storms that stay men from their labor and plague the flocks, even so... Wrapped in such radiant raiment did Minerva go in among the host and speak man by man to each. First she took the form and voice of Phoenix and spoke to Menelaus son of Atreus, who was standing near her. Menelaus, said she, it will be a shame to dishonor to you if the dogs tear the noble comrade of Achilles under the walls of Troy. Therefore be staunch and urge your men to be so also. Menelaus answered, Phoenix, my good old friend, may Minerva vouchsafe me strength and keep the darts from off me. 
for so I shall stand by Patroclus and defend him. His death has gone to my heart, but Hector is as a raging fire and deals his blow without ceasing, for Jove is now granting him a time of triumph. Minerva was pleased at his having named herself before any other of the gods. Therefore she put strength into his knees and shoulders, and made him as bold as a fly, which, though driven off the will, yet come again and bite if it can, so dearly does it love man's blood. Even so bold as this did she make him as he stood over Patroclus and threw his spear. Now there was among the Trojans a man named Podes, son of Etion, who was both rich and valiant. Hector held him in the highest honor, for he was a comrade and boon companion. The spear of Menelaus struck this man in a girdle just as he had turned in flight, and went right through him. Whereon he fell heavily forward, and Menelaus son of Atreus drew off his body from the Trojans into the ranks of his own people. Apollo then went up to Hector and spurred him on to fight, in the likeness of Phaenops, son of Asius, who had lived in Abydos and was the most favored of all Hectored guests. In his likeness, Apollo said, Hector, who of the Achaeans will fear you henceforward now that you have quailed before Menelaus, who has ever been rated poorly as a soldier? Yet he now has a corpse away from the Trojans single-handed, and slain your own true comrade, a man brave among the foremost, Podes, son of Adion. A dark cloud of grief fell upon Hector as he heard, and he made his way to the front clad in full armor. Thereon the son of Saturn seized his bright-tasseled aegis and veiled Ida in a cloud. He sent forth his lightning and his thunders, and as he shook his aegis he gave victory to the Trojans and routed the Achaeans. The panic was begun by Penelius the Boeotian, for while keeping his face turned ever towards the foe he had been hit with a spear on the upper part of the shoulder. A spear thrown by Polydamus had grazed the top of his bone, for Polydamus had come up to him and struck him from close at hand. Then Hector, in close combat, struck Letius, son of noble Asitrion, in the hand by the wrist, and disabled him from fighting further. He looked about him in dismay, knowing that never again should he wield spear in battle with the Trojans. While Hector was in pursuit of Letius, Idomeneus struck him on the breastplate over his chest near the nipple, but the spear broke in the shaft, and the Trojans cheered aloud. Hector then aimed at Idomeneus, son of Deucalion, as he was standing on his chariot, and very narrowly missed him, but the spear hit Coriolanus, follow and charioteer of Meriones, who had come with him from Lictius. Idomeneus had left the ships on foot, and would have afforded a great triumph to the Trojans if Coriolanus had not driven quickly up to him. He therefore brought life and rescue to Idomeneus, but himself fell by the hand of murderous Hector. For Hector hit him on the jaw under the ear, the end of the spear drove out his teeth and cut his tongue in two pieces, so that he fell from his chariot and let the reins fall to the ground. Meriones gathered them up from the ground and took them into his own hands. Then he said to Inomenius, Lay on till you get back to the ships, for you must see that the day is no longer ours. On this, Idomeneus lashed the horses to the ships, for fear had taken hold upon him. Ajax and Menelaus noted how Jove had turned the scale in favor of the Trojans, and Ajax was the first to speak. Alas, said he, even a fool may see that Father Jove is helping the Trojans. All their weapons strike home, no matter whether it be a brave man or a coward that hurls them. Jove speeds all alike, where ours fall, each one of them without effect. What then will be best, both as regards rescuing the body and our return to the joy of our friends who will be grieving as they look hitherwards? For they will make sure that nothing can now check the terrible hands of Hector and that he will fling himself upon our ships. I wish that someone would go and tell the son of Peleus at once, for I do not think that he can yet have heard the sad news that the dearest of his friends has fallen. But I can see not a man among the Achaeans to send, for they and their charioteers are all alike hidden in darkness. O oh, Father Jove, lift this cloud from over the sons of the Achaeans. Make heaven serene and let us see, if you will, that we perish. Let us fall at any rate by daylight. Father Jove heard him and had compassion upon his tears. Forthwith he chased away the cloud of darkness, so that the sun shone out and all the fighting was revealed. Ajax then said to Menelaus, Look, Menelaus, and if Antilochus son of Nestor be still living... Send him at once to tell Achilles that by far the dearest to him of all his comrades has fallen. Menelaus heeded his words and went his way as a lion from a stockyard. The lion is tired of attacking the men and hounds who keep watch the whole night through and will not let him feast on the fat of their herd. In his lust of meat he makes straight at them but in vain, for darts from strong hands assail them and burning brands which daunt him for all his hunger. So in the morning he slinks sulkily away. 
Even so did Menelaus sorely against his will leave Patroclus, in great fear lest the Achaeans should be driven back in rout and let him fall into the hands of the foe. He charged Meriones and the two Ajaxes straightly, saying, Ajaxes and Meriones, leaders of the Argives, now indeed remember how good Patroclus was. He was ever courteous while alive. Bear it in mind now that he is dead. With this Menelaus left them, looking round as keenly as an eagle, whose sight they say is keener than of any other bird, however high he may be in the heavens. Not a hare that runs can escape him by crouching under the bush or thicket, for he will swoop down upon it and make an end of it. Even so, O Menelaus, did your keen eyes range round the mighty host of your followers to see if you could find the son of Nestor still alive. Presently Menelaus saw him in the extreme left of the battle, cheering on his men and exhorting them to fight boldly. Menelaus went up to him and said, Antilochus, come here and listen to sad news, which I would indeed were untrue. You must see with your own eyes that heaven is heaping calamity upon the Danians and giving victory to the Trojans. Patroclus has fallen who was the bravest of the Achaeans, and sorely will the Danans miss him. Run instantly to the ships and tell Achilles that he may come to rescue the body and bear it to the ships. As for the armor, Hector already has it. Antilochus was struck with horror. For a long time he was speechless, his eyes filled with tears, and he could find no utterance. But he did as Menelaus had said, and set off running as soon as he had given his armor to a comrade, Laodicus, who was wheeling his horse round close behind him. Thus then did he run weeping from the field to carry the bad news to Achilles son of Peleus. Nor were you, O Menelaus, minded to succor his harried comrades when Antilochus had left the Pylians, and greatly did they miss him. But he sent them noble Thrasymedes, and himself went back to Patroclus. He came running up to the two Ajaxons and said, I have sent Antilochus to the ship to tell Achilles, but rage against Hector as he may, he cannot come, for he cannot fight without armor. What then will be our best plan, both as regards rescuing the dead and our own escape from death among the battle cry of the Trojans? Ajax answered, Menelaus, you have said well. Do you then, and Meriones stoop down, raise the body and bear it out of the fray, while we two behind you keep off Hector and the Trojans, one in heart as in name, and long used to fighting side by side with one another. On this Menelaus and Meriones took the dead man in their arms and lifted him high aloft with a great effort. The Trojan host raised a hue and cry behind them when they saw the Achaeans bearing the body away and flew after them like hounds attacking a wounded bear at the loo of a band of young huntsmen. For while the hounds fly at him as though they would tear him to pieces, but now and again he turns on them in a fury, scarring and scattering them in all directions, even so did the Trojans for a while charge in a body, striking with sword and spears pointed at both ends. But when the two Ajaxes faced them and stood at bay, they would turn pale, and no man dared press on to fight further about the dead. In this wise did the two heroes strain every nerve to bear the body to the ships out of the fight. The battle raged round them like fierce flames that when once kindled spread like wildfire over a city, and the houses fall in the glare of its burning. Even such was the roar and tramp of men and horses that pursued them as they bore Patroclus from the field. Or as mules that put forth all their strength to draw some beam of a great piece of ship's timber down a rough mountain track, and they pant and sweat as they, go even so did Menelaus and pant and sweat as they borne the body of Patroclus. Behind them, the two Ajaxes held stoutly out, as some wooded mountain spur that stretches across a plain will turn water and check the flow even of a great river nor is there any stream strong enough to break through it. Even so did the two Ajaxes face the Trojans and stern the tide of their fighting, though they kept pouring on towards them, and foremost among them all was Aeneas, son of Anchises, with valiant Hector. As a flock of daws or starlings fall to screaming and chattering when they see a falcon, foe to all small birds, come soaring near them, even so did the Achaean youth raise a babble of cries as they fled before Aeneas and Hector, unmindful of their former prowess. In the rout of the Danians, much goodly armor fell round about the trench, and of fighting there was no end. End of Book 17